I V M. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories. India's very own travel podcast where each week we discuss the story of travelers in their own words and reel up their experiences with you our listeners. Hi guys, welcome to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories. I guess this time is not just a traveler but also a filmmaker. We're really excited to have this conversation, so let's jump on to it and find out more. So without introduction I'd like to welcome MSN Karthik a travel filmmaker a YouTube star if I may <laughs> <laughs> Karthik thank you so much for being a part of the Musafir stories and uh, welcome we're really looking forward to this conversation because it's the first time for us too that we're uh, speaking to a filmmaker of sorts right uh, <laughs> uh, who has a, a different point of view of seeing things too so really excited about this but uh, before we get into specifics why don't you tell us a little bit more about uh, your story how how you came about being a travel filmmaker and uh, in general how did the travel bug get to you yeah uh, first of all thanks a lot say for having me on musafir stories i've been uh, listening to your podcast for a long time and i've been a fan thank you. and uh, i'm also excited to talk to you today mm-hmm. So to give a brief about me uh, I was born in Hyderabad in the state of Telangana now back then AP right but my father works for a bank so we used to get transferred uh, all around the country so okay. that way I got a chance to uh, you know study in six or seven different schools and it actually opened me culturally it exposed me towards a lot of cultures languages and people mm-hmm. and he did my graduation from IIT Guwahati it was uh, during that time that the travel bug got into me when uh, i was uh, doing my internship in austria so but till then whatever travel i did uh, in my childhood it was with my parents and my uh, my family everything was done by them i used to just go with them go with the flow and and it was during my internship that i got a chance to backpack across eight or nine different countries in europe mm. with my friends okay. so i i did the entire planning i did everything by myself and i liked that experience of backpacking and that's how the travel bug started during that time like uh, in college i i used to be very active in arts and drama clubs mm-hmm. Uh, I was exposed to film as a medium, and uh, that's how I also got interested in films and filmmaking. Okay. Uh, but uh, after graduation, I went uh, took up an MNC job, and then later worked for a couple of startups. Uh, but somewhere, the dream of becoming a traveler or a filmmaker got lost. Mm-hmm. And during 2016, I guess, uh, like after working for four or five years, mm-hmm. I thought I should again pursue my dream of traveling. Uh, like i thought i wanted to make films and travel why not combine both and become a travel filmmaker okay. so i started it as a part time thing and later on in last year i quit my job and i started doing it full time so wow. that's my story wonderful and an exciting story and uh, yeah you're getting the best of both worlds by choosing to be a traveler and a filmmaker a travel filmmaker rather what we usually do karthik with the musafir stories is that uh, whenever we have like a guest traveler uh, come speak with us right we request the guest to take us on a journey with them uh, to a place to a destination and uh, tell us all about it so with that in mind where are you taking us and our listeners to today so we'll be talking about uh, bodh gaya okay. a place in bihar mm-hmm. to give an introduction maybe a uh, like what mecca is for muslims jerusalem is for christians and jews bodh gaya is for buddhists it is one of the holiest places for buddhists and uh, which is the fourth largest religion in the world mm-hmm. and uh, the place is also a unesco's world heritage site and every year around 2 million people come to the place from all around the world and uh, bodh gaya is the place which is believed uh, that uh, prince siddhartha uh, got enlightened under a people tree at that place mm. uh, and this all happened 2600 years ago and the place still stands erect today that is the speciality of the place 
Wonderful. As you said, uh, a historically very, very significant place, right? We really look forward to exploring more of this place and finding out your experience about the place. Um, when is a good time to travel there, Arthak? I would suggest uh, traveling to Bodh Gaya would be perfect when uh, there are a lot of these pujas that happen all around the year. Mm-hmm. Uh, to begin with, there is this uh, Buddha Purnima, which is the birthday of Buddha. Right. The Buddha Purnima happens in May and uh, during October, November time frame, there is a puja called Mahakal Chakra Puja. Mm. And there are other world healing prayer pujas which happen all across the year. Mm. I would suggest uh, people to visit the place during those times because there are a lot of monks who come from uh, countries all across the Southeast Asia, Asia, US, Europe, everywhere. Right. So you get a lot of uh, different perspectives in, in case you want to talk to the monks and understand their insights about their uh, journey, their insights about Buddhism and all. Those times would be the best times to travel to both. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, and, and in terms of getting to Bodh Gaya, what, uh, what are the options and what's the best one? So the closest uh, airport and railway station is in Gaya, which is uh, a town 16 kilometers away from Bodh Gaya. Mm-hmm. But if you are uh, flying from uh, distant places like Mumbai, Bangalore or Delhi, right. you, would, you, you get uh, direct flights to Patna. And then from there, you can take a Shatabdi Express, which takes two hours to go to Gaya. And from Gaya station, you can uh, take uh, auto rickshaw and reach both Gaya. Okay, okay. Uh, now that you've set the context and the background really well, uh, let's get into this journey. Like, what led you to both Gaya? Like, did you have this on your, uh, say, to-do list or your uh, bucket list, as people try, <laughs> like to call it these days, right? Did you have it or was this a happenstance? Uh, how did this happen? No, it it was actually in uh, in mid 2016 when I uh, planned of uh, planned to travel, uh, start traveling again mm-hmm. after a long time, and I was actually uh, going on a holiday for ten days to visit my parents in Kolkata, mm. and I thought uh, I would be at home for ten days without any work. Why not check out some interesting place near Kolkata? Mm. As a person, I don't like uh, touristy kind of destinations because I don't. I don't travel for the sake of traveling. I like to, you know, go to a place, uh, explore the culture, lo- talk to local people, understand the local art, culture, history, mm-hmm. everything. That, that is how I travel. And when I read about Bodh Gaya, the history of the place, the culture of the place, it really blew my mind. And as I was planning to make a film on a travel destination, I thought uh, Bodh Gaya would be the best place to start with. Absolutely. So, that's how I chose Bodh Gaya to be my first destination. Okay, okay. And in uh, terms of the number of days that you spent here, um, how, how long was it? So I actually went to the place uh, two times within a span of two months. Uh-huh. So I liked it so much that uh, <laughs> the first time I was there, I was there for uh, three days. Okay. And then uh, I went uh, there in November. Mm. And then uh, in December, there was a colleague's marriage which was happening in Patna. Mm. And I couldn't resist myself from <laughs> going back to Bodh Gaya when I went there. So the second time I was there for two days. Okay, wonderful. Uh, maybe, maybe, it, maybe it was uh, a divine calling, right? that uh, got you back to <laughs> Bodh Gaya a second time? Yeah, I would like to think so. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, even even otherwise, I would strongly suggest uh, people to make use of uh, things like weddings and all of that to uh, travel as much as you can um, because otherwise it might, given the busy work schedules and everything, it might be a little tough to find time off to travel. So I personally try right. to make use of um, like weddings and uh, especially if it's a colleague's weddings in a different town, I definitely try and uh, make use of that uh, with a couple of extra days added to cover the uh, place or the, an area on route or something like that. So Got it. Got it. let's get started with uh, a little bit more about the place itself, right? Uh, as you rightly pointed out at the beginning that uh, historically it's mm. been a very, very significant place and uh, it's the home of Buddhism also. Here's yeah. where it all started. And uh, just as a little bit of a background, uh, as, as uh, even you yeah. mentioned at the beginning, that uh, Prince Siddhartha, right, um, who yeah. was here in search of enlightenment, in search of uh, the truth, if I may, right? Correct. Uh, that's Correct. how we ended up here. He was originally from um, what is modern day Nepal, right? Lumbini. Yes. Right. Yes, and yes. he ended ended up here in uh, this part of the world. It is here where he meditated and finally found what he was looking for and uh, what is referred to as the enlightenment. 
Correct. Right. So uh, yeah. he was a prince uh, uh, of a kingdom called Kapila Vastu, uh, that is modern day Nepal, and he was born in Lumbini. Mm-hmm. So there is this interesting story that uh, when uh, Siddhartha was born, mm-hmm. uh, the the king of the kingdom, his his father, he talked to a lot of priests and asked uh, them to uh, you know do his horoscope and do some research about his future and all mm. then the priests come back and say that the uh, the prince would grow up to be either of the two things he he would become a uh, become the greatest emperor of the world has ever seen mm. or he'll become a monk an ascetic and he he will leave everything in his life and then go live as a monk in a forest mm-hmm. so uh, then the king decides that he wants this boy to become a greatest emperor in the world so uh, he encloses the prince from going outside he he keeps the prince all through his childhood he he locks him in the in the palace and uh, with all the wealth and all the enjoyments and all the good things of the life mm-hmm. and he doesn't show him all the bad things bad parts of the life right and and then one day after uh, you know getting married and uh, after uh, you know growing up at at the age of around uh, 25 30 maybe mm-hmm. he goes out and for the first time he sees people suffering till then uh, he didn't know what old age meant he didn't know that people grow old and die right so that was the first time when he sees that people are dying people are suffering from illness in old age and people are you know there are a lot of these diseases and a lot of problems in the world a lot of chaos in the world yep. and it is at that time that he wants you know wants to seek the actual truth mm-hmm. so he has been uh, actually living a true man show all his uh, childhood absolutely and, i think very nicely put yeah yeah and that is uh, the time he realizes that he has been in a matrix and he has to go out and find his own truth mm. and uh, at the age of uh, early 30s he leaves everything and then he travels uh, down south towards india mm-hmm. and he travels in the forest for almost 6 years right and finally he reaches bodh gaya where he sits under a peepal tree mm-hmm. and then he 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 starts meditating there and then he gets enlightened there so that that's how the story goes exactly exactly and uh, as you said this is modern day uh, india modern day bihar and yeah. um, before we uh, kind of explore the that place a little bit more karthik you did mention about the peepal tree right which is popularly referred to uh, as both the bodhi tree or bodhi, the bodhi vriksha bodhi. right correct so this is also i mean um, there is still a tree in in that very same spot that uh, depicts the bodhi tree and uh, it is believed to be a sapling from the original tree also right correct, uh, correct. That's, that's, so every yeah every 2 to 300 years they take uh, the sapling from the old tree and replant it in, in the same uh, place so that the tree is uh, living this is actually fourth or fifth generation tree that uh, i have been told that it's the fourth or fifth generation tree from the original tree mm. because uh, people trees and like banyan trees they live for a long time yep. for a stretch of 500 600 years at mm. a time so wonderful wonderful now you've gotten to bodh gaya and uh, we just spoke about the bodhi vriksha the bodhi tree right uh, but tell us a little bit more about um, what does one see or what can one expect in bodh gaya So uh, the main place that you uh, visit in Bodh Gaya is the Mahabodhi Temple which is where the peepal tree the bodhi tree is also located right and uh, it's a big campus and it was sto- it is told that uh, the main foundation of the tree has been main foundation of the temple has been laid uh, some 2300 years ago by king Ashoka right and a lot of kings after that built a uh, bit by bit of the temple Uh, so that is the main place you visit in uh, bodh gaya so to give a bit of history this temple was under mud and under ruins for almost 6 to 700 years since 12th century ad okay. and it was in 18 uh, i guess it's in 1860s or 1870s that mm-hmm. a british uh, 
uh, archaeologist uh, named Alexander Cunningham. Right. He came uh, to Bodh Gaya and he did ex- excavations there. Mm-hmm. And then he found ruins of a place like this. So right. the entire place was covered in mud. From the 19th century, again, they retrieved the entire place and uh, built so many structures which were broken, which were ruined. Mm-hmm. And then they restored the entire temple, which is which you can uh, see it today. Uh, And the statue of Buddha, which you see in the main temple at uh, Mahabodhi temple, Mm -hmm. it's it's, uh, so brilliant. It's so lively that you experience a feeling of you would feel that it is out of the world. Like when you're standing inside that temple, uh, uh, the main temple premises. So... Yeah, this uh, is the that, great Buddha statue that you're referring to, right? So there is there are two kinds of statues. One is the one you see in the temple, and there is another 80 feet statue, mm-hmm. which uh, which has been donated uh, by Japanese government uh, mm-hmm. in 1980s, mm-hmm. and it, it's 80 feet because Buddha uh, was lived up to the age of 80. Right, so that's what that's, that's, believed, that's, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah, that's why they they erected the statue of uh, 80 feet. And that's also a wonderful place. It's it's around uh, two kilometers away from the main temple. Mm-hmm. Uh, and okay. that's And, and um, yeah, quickly going back to the uh, Mahabodhi temple complex as well, right? Tell us a little bit more uh, because you did mention that uh, its uh, beginnings or uh, the year that it was actually built goes back to, uh, say, 2,300 years ago and uh, it has mm-hmm. its um, connection to Ashoka, right? Ashoka was yeah. one of the, I think, one of the biggest names that embraced Buddhism uh, at the very Correct. beginning, right? Uh, and Correct. he kind of helped it spread in a big way as well. Correct. Correct. Uh, so right from then to, as you said, bit by bit it was built and uh, then over time, around the 12th century, it was also uh, destroyed, right, by the yes. Mughal rulers and the others who yes. kind of invaded India at that time. And uh, uh, for it to be... Uh, again discovered in the 19th, 19th century, 19th century. Uh, yeah. it seems like a, a miracle and um, I'm so <laughs> glad that it's been um, kind of restored and now multiple parts have been added to the complex etc uh, speaking a little bit more about the temple itself right the Mahabodhi temple uh, what ki- uh, what is the kind of um, architecture and uh, s- resemblance is it uh, more say influenced by Tibetan style of architecture or uh, what do you see Karthik? No, it's it's completely an Indian style temple. It it has that eloquent design uh, element, and uh, so since it has been built uh, almost two thousand years ago, right. so it, it doesn't have any other Persian, Persian or uh, Tibetan or any other uh, cultural influences on the temple. It's it's a very native Indian style. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can actually see the difference in the temple domes of. Uh, when you see this and when you compare this with other uh, country temples that I mentioned that right. are there in both there, you can see the clear stark difference between both of the domes and mm-hmm. the whole architecture and all. At the middle of the temple complex is the uh, main uh, dome of the temple and everything. And behind the uh, main temple, there is this Bodhi tree. Mm-hmm. And all around the temple, there are a lot of Buddhist stupas. Some of them date back 2,000 years ago, 2,300 years ago. Mm. And many of them have been sent by various other countries to India uh, just uh, in order to be uh, get installed in the temple complex. Mm-hmm. So there are a lot of, there are almost, you know, you can find them more than thousands of stupas that are there uh, all around the main complex. Right. Wow. And there are a lot of gardens where uh, you see uh, monks sitting and meditating, and it, it's really a wonderful place. Yeah. I think, uh, I, I think, as uh, I was mentioning to you off the record, right, while we were having that initial conversation too, that uh, in places like these, uh, more than things to see, it is the experience. Correct. Counts so much more. Um, Correct. And also the interactions. So um, going about the interactions, right? Uh, uh, did you have a chance to like talk to some of these um, Buddhist monks and uh, especially ones who are traveling from say different parts of the world, etc.? Yeah. So uh, my main focus along with the uh, travel was to make a documentary on the place. So mm-hmm. uh, the, the time I went was, I, I was really lucky because I didn't uh, plan to go there uh, during that Monlam Puja. 
Mm. I I landed there by you know accident, <laughs> but it was really lucky for me to be there on that time, okay. and I could talk to almost uh, fifteen to twenty monks with varied backgrounds. Mm. So I actually talked to a monk who is from Tibet, and he now heads the uh, main Buddhist uh, university in Himachal Pradesh. Oh, okay. uh, he's so the name of the person is Kempo Choing Dorje. He, he he he's also there in my documentary. Okay. And I talked to him. I talked to monks from Myanmar, Tibet, uh, Vietnam, uh, France, and I even spoke to a person who was born Catholic, raised Catholic from the U.S. Uh-huh. And then uh, in his middle age, he he traveled to India. He found out about Buddhism. He converted to Buddhism, and he stays now in Himachal Pradesh practicing Buddhism. It it was really exciting listening to all those stories and mm-hmm. understanding their perspective about Buddhism and enlightenment and what life is. The main lesson I learned from the trip was, uh, you don't need money to be happy in life. That is one of the main lessons I learned. You just need peace of mind. That's it. So peace of mind doesn't come with money. Yeah, that's so so uh, deep, right? Uh, because especially in these times and um, in this in this uh, it is a rat race of sorts right you're always um, comparing Sorry. yourselves to your peers and uh, how much more am i making how much less am i making and uh, uh, that kind of dictates how you live your life and what you're chasing and uh, uh, everything else right it's more really? um, about materialistic things I I don't blame anybody per se. I'm, I'm just saying that's how we're conditioned, right? Right from the Sorry. very first day, uh, even in school, right? It's always peer pressure. It's always things. It's um, more more chasing. That's worldly things. It's materialistic things, and I think that's where Buddhism calls this out and um, uh, highlights how, how important Sorry. things like say peace of mind or uh, being contented and uh, understanding the pain and the suffering of um, other Sorry. people who are less fortunate in some ways etc right so um, and I'm glad that uh, one of the very important uh, lessons that you took away from um, mm. from uh, from this whole trip and from uh, that you try to give away from the documentary as well is uh, such an important thing but uh, if I have to ask uh, in terms of um, your interactions with the, uh, these monks right did you feel like diverging opinions because they were all from different places or uh, do you feel like at the end of the day, well, even if they uh, said it in different words, that all their opinions were eventually converging? Well, how did you feel about that? Yeah, all the opinions were converging, mm-hmm. I would say that. Because mm-hmm. uh, ultimately, not only uh, in terms of these uh, monks, what I understood was all religions, not only Buddhism, mm-hmm. every religion teaches you uh, the same thing. Like mm-hmm. everyone's goal is enlightenment. But Hindus may call it moksha, Buddhists may call it nirvana, Christians may call it salvation. It's mm-hmm. it's just the terminology. Mm-hmm. Everyone actually, they strive for the ultimate happiness, ultimate uh, joy. It's just that the words are different. Right. And uh, similar to that, even when I spoke to all these monks, mm-hmm. they were all saying the same thing because they were all practicing the same thing. They were all, uh, you know... Uh, trying to be peaceful in life. Many of them left their uh, families. Many of them left their countries, came there to Bodhga and became a monk, staying there uh, forever. Mm -hmm. So I felt everyone was talking about the same thing. Yeah, it is very deep as a philosophy, as a concept, as an understanding. It is very deep and yet so simple, right? Uh, It's just the way we approach it and the, the way we look at it. Um, now, uh, now, having s- spent some time in the complex, right? You said uh, you said you spent some time uh, talking to the monks. Then there was also the Bodhi tree or the Bodhi Vriksha that you saw. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit more about these uh, different temples or monasteries from different countries, right? Um, I-, I thought that was pretty unique too, in terms of how ev- all of them are related to Buddhism, but uh, they're all from different countries, and uh, even in terms of appearance, right? They're so different. Okay. So, how was that? How was that uh, experience going about these uh, different temples and monasteries? And you said these are within the complex or just outside of the complex? No, the, these are all outside the complex. Okay. So the uh, temples uh, range from, you know, 200 meters to 2 kilometers based okay. on where the government gave them land. Uh-huh. So they, they had set up the, their own temples there. Okay. And 
and the most important thing that i found out was although a lot of people for example there are a lot of people who come from vietnam or myanmar or tibet or many other southeast asian countries mm-hmm. although they visit their own temples uh, own uh, you know with their own cultures with their own uh, you know background mm-hmm. uh, they all come and converge at the mahabodhi temple and the important thing here was the mahabodhi temple uh, although uh, like i i would say you find peace and harmony in chaos when mm. you are in mahabodhi temple mm. so there are a lot of people from a lot of different cultures backgrounds languages and countries mm. chanting in their own language mm. yet you feel you are peaceful mm. so that is one of the most important things about the mahabodhi temple i feel that you you can take a lessons from it you can learn how to live in a modern society where there are a lot of people with varied views and you can still uh, live in harmony without war so that is one important lesson it teaches when 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 you see a lot of these cultures coming together at the same place and uh, meditating towards the same goal Mm-hmm. and it's uh, it's so much more relevant in the times we're living in right especially correct, like correct. these days exactly. i mean it's become like as they say right dog eat dog kind of a world <laughs> so it's so much more relevant in today's times so that's wonderful and uh, tell us a little bit more about um, other things you saw within the complex or uh, say did you need to step out of the complex for uh, some of the other places you visited so uh, apart from the temples that i've spoken about there is this uh, one major ground area which is called the kala chakra maidan okay. uh, which is there just outside the temple premises and it it is a place where it's a, it's a huge ground stadium kind of thing where uh, all these uh, main pujas are held mm-hmm. and whenever uh, dalai lama visits bodh gaya he uh, organizes the puja and he gives the speech and everything in that uh, area in in that maidan mm-hmm. and uh, to visit the place at that time is important because the, the maidan is completely covered with white sheets and the whole thing is covered from the top and you see unlimited number of red robes wearing mm-hmm. people uh, in in all directions if you stand in in, in the middle and see mm-hmm. you you would be <laughs> in in the middle of a flood of red <laughs> and the top is on white if you if you google images of kal chakra maidan uh-huh. you would understand what i'm saying <laughs> so it's an amazing sight to be there during that time okay so that that, that is one place to visit uh, when, whenever there is a puja happening Okay, wonderful, wonderful. And uh, I think as you rightly pointed out, right, uh, that beautiful sea of uh, maroon or red, as you call yeah. it. And uh, there's also slight um, tinges of yellow also, right? Uh, because I think correct, in a row they were yeah, yellowish. Yes. Yeah, so I think that's a beautiful sight, especially when um, you are in a big field, a big maidan, uh, like uh, like the one you mentioned. And and uh, any any more experiences that uh, related experience the experiences that you'd like to share, Karthik? Yeah, uh, after my journey to Bodh Gaya, uh, so I I was uh, really uh, fascinated by the religion, the teachings of Buddha, and uh, the meditation techniques. Mm. And I went back and I did some research, and I found out about this program called Vipassana. Okay. So Vipassana is a meditation retreat which happens all around the world at various uh, centers. Mm. The idea of Vipassana is that you are away from the hustle and bustle of cities. Mm-hmm. and from your day to day duties and you don't have any connection with the outer world you don't have laptops you don't have books to read you don't have cell phones anything mm-hmm. and you are not allowed to talk to anyone and you stay like that for 10 days and for those 10 days you the only task you have is to meditate and it it's a wonderful experience because for example a the main excuse we uh, give every day in our day to day life not to meditate is that you have a lot of duties to perform day to day activities to perform right and during those 12 days they take away all those duties from you and you have no excuse whatsoever to give them not to meditate uh-huh. and they take care of your lodging food everything is free of cost you the only task is to sit and meditate for 10 hours a day and during that time they teach you uh, for the first 3 days they teach you anapana meditation which mm-hmm. is to observe the breath uh, observe your breath from your stomach to nose and and from fourth day onwards they teach you a technique called uh, 
vipassana which was you know the actual technique used by lord buddha to get enlightened to give you a brief understanding of what enlightenment is mm-hmm. enlightenment is being aware of self and everything that is around you when you are in that phase that stage you don't differentiate between self and others mm-hmm. everything is same for you and that comes with the technique of vipassana where you try to become aware of each and every vibration that is happening in and around your body okay. so you become aware of everything you make your mind calm and sit relax and just observe things that are happening and that those 10 days were like one of the best days of my life mm-hmm. and i would recommend anyone who is interested in both gaya or buddhism or would l- want to learn more about this mm-hmm. should definitely check out that program called vipassana mm-hmm. sounds very very interesting and uh, uh, <laughs> initially i think it uh, does put me in a spot right you're saying uh, everything is taken away from you like uh, your phones your responsibilities uh, whatever you uh, otherwise use as excuses to go away from um, your uh, you time right time for yourself you Correct. those things are taken away from you and uh, i think i would be in a spot of bother as to what would i do without all of that <laughs> but i think it's a, a very good way of channeling all of that energy and um, think about yourself right B- become self aware as you're saying um, b- b- how, how does one you said these are done all over the country so how, how does one get in touch with say whoever runs this or who who does this so there is this website called dhamma.org mm. Uh so if you go to that website you'll find uh, centers that are there in almost every city even Hyderabad Pune Delhi Bangalore every city has a vipassana center mm. and uh, you just uh, see the schedule of when is the next uh, you know meditation retreat happening in your city mm. and you, you just apply them online apply to them online and you'll get a reply within uh, a week or so so you just have to take your clothes there and everything else would be taken care of by them i did it in a place called nagarjun sagar in okay. andhra pradesh mm-hmm. and it's a beautiful place to do vipassana because it's uh, uh, just beside the backwaters of a dam right uh, right uh, the view is wonderful and you can sit there relax just mm-hmm. meditate uh, and this vipassana meditation this was this whole concept was uh, founded and uh, you know uh, propagated by a person called sn goenka who was from Rajasthan and he went uh, to Burma stayed there for most of his life in Burma learned this technique in Myanmar Burma mm-hmm. and then came back to India and started propagating this in India and now it's famous all over the world mm, very very interesting and you said the website one should refer to as this is it is d h a m m a dhamma.org okay brilliant we will include that in the show notes section of the podcast as well so that way listeners can um, have a ready reckoner to access this i think it's been a great great way of um, going and experiencing the the home of buddhism a lot of Correct. ways too uh, now i would strongly suggest listeners to go check out uh, karthik's brilliant youtube uh, documentary it's, uh, as i said it's available on youtube just go look out for his channel advaita a d w h y t a that that's yes, how it's it spelled is. right yes a d w h y t a advaita advaita yeah. uh, check out his channel advaita and uh, under that if you look for the bodhgaya video i think it's a brilliant under 30 minute documentary that he's made uh, where he also covers a lot of experiences with um, some of the monks that were visiting at that time right uh, I, i would strongly urge people to go check out but uh, otherwise karthik what's the best way for uh, people to kind of keep track of your work and uh, follow your work so uh, yeah you you they can uh, just uh, subscribe to my youtube channel or follow me on facebook uh, .com/adwhyta advaita mm-hmm. okay or they can find me on instagram at uh, msn karthik k a r t h i k wonderful we will include yeah. all of those handles and those uh, social media links in the show notes section that way cool. you can go follow karthik's work but again karthik before we uh, say goodbye i'd like to thank you so very much for um, sharing this wonderful experience as i said at the beginning it's been uh, a different episode in sorts that um, we didn't really have uh, a nightmare or a list of places to 
see your uh, like activities to do etc but this is more about the experience more about the calmness uh, the vibes of the place and um, the chanting of the monks uh, right they're chanting in their own different languages and uh, even though you may consider it to be a cacophony of sorts um, but it does all culminate into a beautiful uh, vibe in the whole place uh, in the um, in the, the um, mahabodhi temple complex as well as uh, both gaya in general and uh, yeah uh, add to this the wave or the sea of uh, maroon and red and yellow of the robes of the monks right that and the uh, prayer wheels in the background all of that i think it <laughs> makes for a brilliant brilliant experience it is divine i think that's all i can say about it um, the best way to do this is go experience it for yourself if you think you're still some way off from getting there i would strongly suggest you to go check out karthik's documentary that's available on youtube that we have linked in the show notes um and then get inspired that's the best way you can do justice to karthik's documentary and to both gaya as well thank you so much karthik enjoyed this conversation thanks a lot sir thanks a lot for having me on the show was yet another great episode of the Wasafir Stories. If you guys like the show, please subscribe to us on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, Audio Boom, Savan, Pocket Casts, Castbox, Stitcher, or any other podcasting app available on iOS or Android. Please do leave us a review on iTunes. It goes a long way in the show's discoverability. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. We go by the handle The Wasafir Stories. or if it suits you you could email us at the musafir stories at gmail.com or visit our website at www.themusafirstories.com for more information all of these links will be made available in the show notes section of each episode so here's to more traveling sharing and inspiring stay tuned for our next episode until then happy travels and goodbye